Welcome back. Yes, and uh, okay, so uh, next uh, uh, speaker uh, is uh, Maria Lore Sulpizzi from uh, uh, University uh, Johann uh, Gartenberg uh, of Mainz in Germany. And uh, she, uh, she, she is an expert in molecular dynamic techniques uh, applied for uh, different uh, type of systems from uh, uh, pure uh, uh, liquids to interfaces. And, in, uh, uh, and this talk will be about, uh, um, again, spectroscopy. And in particular, uh, it's a, a microscopy interpretation of uh, pump probe vibrational spectroscopy from a Benizio molecular dynamics. Uh, Maria Lore. Thank you very much, Nilde, for uh, the organization of this nice symposium and uh, for the invitation to talk. And um, yes, I mean, I would like to, um, to focus today on uh, some vibrational spectroscopy, in particular uh, pump probe spectroscopy of interfaces. Uh, so we all know that um, interfaces uh, are different from bulk, from both liquids and uh, solid perspectives. Um, indeed, uh, where the solid and the liquids meet, of course, uh, uh, the, the molecular orientation and the molecular properties in general are quite different, of course, with respect to the bulk. And so it's really desirable to, to have a microscopic atomistic view of, uh, of what's going on at the interface. And this, uh, um, we have seen so far from the uh, computational point of view can be obtained with, uh, with for example, a Benicio molecular dynamics and much less shown very, very nice example on how far we can push such techniques today. And um, from the um, experimental point of view, I mean, in the last decades, there's been a really a tremendous advance of experimental technique selectively addressing interfaces. One of them is uh, um, the some, from some frequency generation vibrational spectroscopy, uh, which permitted essentially to extend the power of the IR spectroscopy to the interface. Indeed, uh, it's capable of, uh, of providing details of uh, vibrational spectra selectively at the thin layers. I mean, how thin this is, of course, a matter of being discussed, but uh, of the interfacial layers, which is uh, on um, sitting at the interface. How it works, I mean, in uh, a very simple uh, words, is the combination of IR and visible beam, which sum into this uh, some frequency generation. And what is uh, special about that is that uh, um, um, the selection rule of such spectroscopy are such that uh, if we are dealing with a centrosymmetric environment, so for example, a bulk liquid, in particular, for example, of bulk water, um, the signal recorded uh, by the experiment is actually um, a zero, and actually, in particular, the response function, which is uh, the chi two, which is measured in the experiments, um, it's, it's it's not giving a signal from from the bulk, and this this is the reason why this is permittively selectively address the um, the interface. Um, so in, in particular, what happens is that if we do have, for example, an interface which breaks the symmetry, this will bring to a reorientation of the waters and this will bring um, actually a signal which is different from zero. Now, uh, although this technique is extremely powerful from, from the experimental point of view, of course, there are still a lot of questions which are, which are open and where the modeling is actually needed in order to interpret experiments. One of them is, for example, how far is the ordering extending? This is actually not so easy to extract from the experiments. And another point uh, that is also uh, difficult to address uh, is the lateral distribution. So if, for example, there is a, there's a charge distribution, um, it's difficult for a, a, an SFG experiment uh, to distinguish uh, uh, localized versus delocalized charges uh, and uh, actually obtain information on uh, the lateral uh, perspective. And um, this is also the reason why already from the very beginning of uh, the SFG spectroscopy, there's been a lot of effort and in, uh, in also 
trying to compute uh, um, SFG spectra from the simulation. And actually, um, simulation have been used already for a lot of time, for a long time, uh, in order to interpret uh, the experimental spectra. Um, from the simulation point of view, uh, one of the first to, to, to work in this field has been, for example, Morita, and he was one of the first to use uh, a uh, suitable correlation function extracted from the simulation in order to calculate the spectra. And here we see, for example, the expression uh, that um, can be um, calculated from, from the simulation. This is the chi2 response function, which can be actually obtained from a correlation function, which is the correlation function between the time derivative of the polarizability of the system and of the dipole moment. And these quantities can be obtained uh, from, uh, let's say, an atomistic simulation, for example. And, um, and, and the, in this way, the spectra can be obtained. And, uh, and uh, in the early days of uh, the computation of such spectra, uh, simplified models were used in order to estimate the polarizability and the, the, the dipole moment. Of course, one uh, would like uh, uh, to, to, to really go in the direction of using the most uh, uh, sophisticated uh, possible techniques and also uh, try to use uh, the most possible parameter-free approach. So for example, uh, use uh, uh, ab initio simulation uh, uh, in order to compute this, uh, this response function. The drawback is that, of course, uh, um, obtaining converged uh, uh, correlation function to extract the spectra is not an easy job, especially because in ab initio molecular dynamics, the simulations are already by themselves quite expensive. And on top of this, uh, calculation of accurate polarizability and double moment require an extra cost, which can, of course, uh, one would really like to save. So a possible solution to avoid this is to actually, instead of directly computing the polarizability and the dipole moment, to resort to some simplified expression where actually a suitable uh, vibrational density of states are used, incorporating the correct selection rules for the spectroscopy. And um, this can be done if one uh, expressed the, the local molecular dipoles and polarizability in terms of the velocity. And uh, the velocity are uh, a simple product of each simulation run and actually do not require any additional cost in, uh, in, the, in the molecular dynamics and the four would already by themselves uh, permit to speed up uh, a lot of calculation. And in particular, um, Remy Katib has been do doing a lot of work in this direction um, to come up with um, a calculation which is just using the, the, the vibrational density of states um, with suitable selection rules, as I was mentioning, in order to, to speed up simulation. And uh, indeed, uh, if we use uh, such an approach, uh, it's possible, for example, to extend uh, the calculation of, uh, let's say, ab initio spectra, so calculated on ab initio molecular dynamics, to, to a variety of, uh, of different models. And then this would also permit a better, uh, better comparison uh, with the experiments. Um, I'll just give you an, uh, an example of uh, an application that uh, we have been uh, looking at, uh, we have been doing in the group. And uh, this is on uh, a calcium fluoride water interface at low pH. Uh, it's an interesting example because on one side it's, uh, it's a relatively simple system. So um, in order also to, to, to characterize at the atomistic level, it's, um, it's a, relatively simple and on the other end uh, can be also addressed from the experimental point of view with quite higher accuracy. And so here also we worked in collaboration with the experimental group of uh, Ellen Bacchus and then we, we were really coming from the two sides, from the experimental side, uh, from, from air side and from the computational side from, from our, uh, in order really try to, to understand what's going on at uh, this surface. So um, the proposed uh, mechanism at low pH is that uh, 
the, the dissolution of the topmost uh, layer of uh, the fluoride atoms can leave uh, vacancies uh, which uh, positively charge the surface. I mean, according to this, this formula here below. Um, since uh, the early days of the uh, some frequency generation spectroscopy, um, some spectra were calculated, for example, in the group of Gary Richmond, and um, they were interpreted uh, in terms of uh, uh, charge defect uh, orienting the water at the interfaces. On the other end, uh, slightly more recently, um, some AFM experiments uh, um, were also conducted on, on this type of systems and actually providing a slightly different picture. So they were claiming that uh, at low pH, uh, the terraces and then this, uh, this structure that can, could be recorded at the interface on the fluoride and in particular on the 111 uh, surface would be done due to the um, proton adsorption. So from us was a kind of uh, interesting test to, to, to look at these two possible hypotheses. So um, actually was the, um, what, what was the possible situation at low pH? So uh, we were observing the formation of vacancy and sort of positive defects forming at the surface, or we were observing proton excess localizing at the interface. In order to, to answer such uh, a question, uh, we have been calculating quite a few of uh, different spectra for different values of uh, charge defect at the surface. Um, so for example, here it's, uh, it's an, an excess of uh, a total of four positive charges. Then we also consider two positive charges, one positive charges. And for all of them, we have been calculating the, uh, the SFG spectrum. And uh, I, th I think the, the, the most interesting comparison actually is between uh, two systems of, of the same charge, where we compare a two plus created by vacancy at the surface with a two plus created instead by proton excess at the surface. The SFG spectra in the real part, in the imaginary part, as well as the, the intensity as reported in this, in this figure here. And in particular, the continuous line is that for the charge defect, so the fluorine vacancy, while the dashed line are corresponding to this proton excess. So th this is quite astonishing. I, I mean, how different uh, an SFG spectra can be in case of uh, a localized charge defect and a diffuse charge defect. Indeed, uh, a localized charge defect as a, a fluoride vacancy can really orient the water and pin the water at the surface in a very strong way, producing a quite high intensity, for example, of this imaginary part here, the red one. On the other end, we know that protons are diffusing at the interface and are mobile. And then uh, uh, although they tend to res res reside in this um, layer close to the surface, uh, they, are, they are not localized. And so there's a continuous rearrangement of the water. Therefore, the global effect is very different. So we believe that the strong um, uh, signal that was recorded in the early experiments and then also obtained uh, uh, in the experiments by Ellen in a, more sophisticated um, phase resolved uh, experiments can be really due to the presence of defect. And instead the, the proton, uh, the proton, the, the, the simple presence of, of the diffusive protons wouldn't be really able to, to, to produce a, such a strong effect. So as for the IR, I mean, for the IR has been, known for, for a lot of time and then has, has, has been used also for a lot of time, um, the, a multidimensional version of the spectroscopy also for the SFG, uh, somewhat 
more recently, starting from the early 2000s, actually, although there were already some pioneering experiments from the group of Shen before, um, there have been also a multidimensional uh, um, version of uh, the SFG. So the idea uh, is, as in the in the standard the pump probe uh, uh, IR experiments, uh, in addition to the to the detection setup, there is also a pumping uh, um, incoming beam. So uh, a first IR beam um, put the system into the vibrational excited state, and then there's a detection um, setup which measure as function of the time the SFG signal. Why this is also uh, very interesting? Um, well, because it, it permits uh, to have a picture of how the energy that is introduced into the system, and for example, in this case, produce vibrational excited state, is relaxed within the system. And uh, um, the way that is relaxed, the time scales on which the relaxation of course, of course, provide important information on uh, uh, the specific hydrogen bond network that is formed at the interface on the specific ion and water interaction and then the specific surface interaction. Um, so it's very interesting to, to understand what is the dissipation mechanism and what is the molecular uh, and atomistic pictures behind them such experiments. So uh, although, I mean, the most straightforward approach may be um, seems to just, as we did for the study case, go and calculate the response function, these are actually rather complicated. In, in, I mean, we have already seen that uh, calculation of an SFG spectrum, it can be quite an expensive um, calculation as we know that we have to converge a second order um, correlation function. If we consider a pump probe version of the SFG, we will have uh, a response function of fourth order, very complicated uh, correlation function. Actually, all the formalism exists. Indeed, this due uh, to, the, to the work of uh, Mukamel, and also has been applied with simplified approach to some to some system. And then, for example, Yuki Nagata did some work in this in this direction. But it's certainly something which one cannot really think uh, if really using ab initio molecular dynamics. The four a strategy to obtain kind of uh, the same information that is obtaining the experiment, but in the simulation, is that of trying to simulate the energy relaxation in the simulation. And this can be done using an um, out of equilibrium molecular dynamics. The idea is that uh, um, in vibrational uh, excitation is produced into the system in a sort of analogous way to what happens into the experiment. So of course, I mean, with all uh, the, 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 the difference. So we know that uh, the, the experimental beam has a, has a, has a size of a uh, uh, few nanometers, so which means uh, at least, which means that we, it's already exceeding the, the size of possibly of a box. Uh, but in the simulation, we can be quite selective and uh, we can just excite uh, um, single water molecules within our, uh, our um, our uh, simulation box. And we can repeat these experiments on uh, several, uh, several water molecules uh, as function of the time all over a long uh, equilibrium trajectory. And um, uh, the, the way the excitation is produced is actually very simple. The idea is that some extra velocity is added to, to our molecule using um, a given symmetry. So we know that uh, Although the vibrational modes in the water are collective uh, uh, in, in, in the bulk as well as at the surface, uh, actually the, the local modes uh, pretty much resembles uh, the, those of uh, a simple isolated water. So the stretching, the bending, uh, vibration. So we, we can talk still about somehow local modes. So if we, for example, excite a given water molecules giving extra velocity uh, in the direction corresponding to the stretching, what we actually record 
in the VDOS is an excitation with a frequency which actually corresponds to the stretching frequency. So in this way, using the symmetry of the modes, we are able to selectively in inject energy of the system at a given frequency and so to excite a certain vibrational mode. Uh, the advantage of being localized is that, uh, uh, of course, uh, the mode, uh, um, the, the energy is only set on a water molecules, and then we can really follow as function of the time where the energy is distributing. And this is this is done with uh, uh, this um, um, NV simulation, where instantaneously the system is brought out of the equilibrium, and then the energy uh, would relax. We have devised uh, some uh, proper uh, um, uh, some proper uh, indicator of, of the energy, and this is done uh, in terms of uh, um, uh, power spectrum, and in particular a difference in the power spectrum between an excited uh, um, spectrum for, for given molecules and the corresponding equilibrium one. And using as uh, this, this quantity, monitoring this quantity as function of time, we can look how the energy is flowing out of, of the system. And uh, this is just an example for, for bulk water, which is, uh, of course, a standard uh, testing example. So here in this graph, you can see uh, essentially this quantity I plotted as function of the time for the stretching mode of the excited water molecules, which you see that the energy now it's uh, is starting from initial values, so all, all we put it in which is normalized in this way, and then it's flowing out in a kind of mode that we can define a kind of mono exponential. And then the other hand, you see that energy starts to appear in different modes of the system. So for example, the most populated one would be the stretching mode of the first solvation shell. And then here you see that there's the second salvation shell, which starts to be populated in terms of energy uh, at a somewhat later time. And here is the bending mode on the same excited uh, water molecule. So what we learn from here is that, uh, well, the first information, we can calculate how fast the energy lacks out of the modes. And this has been measured, for example, here on the bulk using, uh, of course, an average of, uh, let's say, thousands of, of different, uh, of this realization of this experiment, we do find actually a relaxation time, which is uh, uh, pretty close to the, to the, to the experiments. Uh, so this uh, um, somehow tell us that probably this, this classical way of simulating uh, the relaxation is, is still uh, pretty, pretty good. Uh, what we can also learn is that, uh, yes, I mean, as I, as I said, we can see where the energy is going. And so we see that the main channel is really the coupling between the vibrational modes of, of the excited water with the first solvation shell. And, um, and um, this, is, this accounts for, for about 20% of, of the energy. Quite interesting, the bending mode of the water itself is not playing a big role. And then this is, uh, um, uh, this is uh, despite the fact that, uh, of course, there could be some, some mixing of the modes due to the uh, anharmonic coupling. And then, but, but the bending here is not playing, uh, let's say, uh, an, an essential role. So there's a lot, of course, uh, also lost through the, to the libration. Uh, uh, another result that uh, we, we found using such an approach is that uh, there's a strong heterogeneity of uh, the OH stretching. So we have calculated uh, this relaxation time as function of the exciteration frequencies and then as function of the number of coordinating hydrogen uh, bonds, uh, so, so in terms of the coordinating water around the excited one. And so you see that there is this, this kind of more or less linear distribution tell us that the transfer is much faster for lower frequencies and which also corresponds to typically higher coordination numbers. So this means that faster relaxation is associated to strong hydrogen bonds, which makes sense in this picture of 
of being uh, the stretching, stretching the main channel for, for, the, for the energy relaxation. While, uh, of course, for less bounded water, so the, the times can be much, much slower. And also this, uh, this heterogeneity was observed in the experiments uh, where uh, they were pumping the, um, the, the energy into the system using different, uh, different frequency. And also they have seen that uh, such uh, heterogeneity is present also in the experiment. Um, of course, the, as, as I was describing the, the stretching mode, it's also possible to excite the bending mode in a kind of similar way. When you do such a thing, you will get uh, um, an excitation spectrum, which is centered around the right frequencies or about six, uh, 1600 centimeters to the minus one. We can also follow the same process of relaxation from the bending. We see that this, this is much faster than the stretching. And this also is in agreement with, um, with experiments. Indeed, also from the, the experimental point of view, that they, they have been uh, finding some, some results. There are, there are quite a few uh, actually um, experimental work on this. Um, on the other hand, it's interesting to see that, uh, uh, of course, uh, the coupling between the mode is different. And, uh, and now, um, uh, for example, there is a much more important role played by the libration. And of course, there's some coupling with the stretching, but it's less important. And, um, and uh, uh, yes, so it, it's, it's possible also to, to, to analyze uh, the, the relaxation pathway in, the, in this specific case. Uh, now, the water surface has been uh, extremely investigated from the experimental point of view. Probably this is, this is the most investigated system. It's also a nice um, and simplest uh, example of hydrophobic interface. So, of, of course, uh, what is found for the water surface may be of relevance also for others. Uh, uh, hydrophobic uh, interfaces, so the barium interfaces that are a bit more difficult to access. Um, uh, it's, a, it's an interesting system where of, at the surface uh, uh, the hydrogen bond network is interrupted and there are free OH which uh, appears in the 20% of the water surface. And from the experimental point of view, uh, they measure a much slower energy relaxation with respect to the bulk. Um, this has been uh, uh, measured uh, in experimentally just looking at the frequency of the free OH. And um, there's been also a lot of discussion regarding the mechanism. So, uh, for example, in a recent contribution, I mean, uh, experimental contribution from, from the group of Taara, um, they have uh, proposed uh, an interpretation of, the, of this quite slow experimental relaxation in terms of, uh, let's say, um, a double process which has to occur at the water surface. First, uh, uh, the excitation of the free OH, I mean, after the free excitation of the, the after the excitation of the free OH, this first uh, a reorientation of the water molecules, uh, which can be actually much faster than in the bulk. But then the diffusion of, of the energy, so the energy relaxation still occurs through the hydrogen bonds, uh, uh, which, is which is now established uh, with, uh, with the other water molecules. Um, we have been uh, uh, looking at uh, the energy relaxation at the surface uh, with, with Navantz. And um, so uh, for, for the moment, we have just kept the same approach that I have described. So um, it's an excitation of, uh, uh, for example, the symmetric stretching. And uh, one interesting thing that we have observed is that uh, if we look at uh, um, the water surface, and in particular uh, at the topmost layer, for example, with just the thickness of uh, two angstrom, uh, we observed already a quite uh, uh, slower relaxation, it's actually the, the double, uh, as slow as in, as in the bulk. And uh, of course, we, if we take now a thickness, which is slightly larger, instead of looking at two angstrom, we look at three angstrom deep, uh, we obtain something that is 
actually a little bit faster, and then uh, the results converge to the bulk as you increase. So now um, this is still faster than the numbers that we have seen from the experiments, because in our case of the moment we have included all uh, the, the bonds, so not only the free OH, and, but also uh, the others. Uh, so one should also take into account this when, when looking at these results. Um, another system that I would like to, to show you um, is the charged interface that we have seen before. So this um, calcium fluoride water interface at low pH. Um, this, this is also an interesting example. So we have seen that for the water surface, um, the relaxation is, is, is much slower than in the bulk. Uh, and this has been uh, clearly attributed uh, to, to the free OH, which do not form hydrogen bonds, so cannot really relax uh, the, the, the excess energy. So the question is now, what happens at such a barrier interface, so for example, with the calcium fluoride? So with the calcium fluoride, we do not have really hydrogen bonds. There are no groups that are really hydrogen bonding. Uh, but uh, of course, we have the presence of these charge defects. So the question is, what is the, the role played by the charge defect in, uh, in, the energy, in the energy transfer? So we have applied the same uh, uh, technique which I have uh, explained you. And now we have selectively excited an interfacial layer of uh, thickness of 3.5 angstrom. So these, these waters, uh, more or less uh, slightly a little bit more than a monolayer, which is in contact with the calcium fluoride. And then for this, uh, we have uh, been doing this excitation, um, of course, considering all the different molecules uh, and uh, obtaining uh, quite a wide spectrum corresponding to different frequencies. The nice thing is that also uh, in the group of Ellen Bacchus, which I mentioned before, uh, they also have been doing this uh, uh, pump probe experiments on the same system, the calcium fluoride and low pH. So we could also uh, compare here uh, our results uh, with, with theirs. So I mean, here are, for example, some experimental uh, results with the excitation at uh, lower and higher frequency. Now the numbers are a little bit different because the experiments were done in D2O and uh, uh, our experiment, our simulation are done actually in, in water. Uh, but uh, uh, an interesting uh, uh, results uh, when we compare and then we, we scale also the, uh, the, the frequency is that uh, we find, uh, you know, such an heterogeneous distribution of uh, uh, relaxation time versus frequency. And this happens in, uh, in the simulation and in the experiments. So the, these black squares uh, corresponds to the experimental data, the red uh, to, the, to the simulation. And um, so, I mean, at first sight, this graph reminds very much what we have seen already for water. So maybe the conclusion is, uh, is actually this, this interfacial water close to the calcium fluoride is actually very much bulk-like. In terms of, uh, of, of, of data, this, this is what would uh, actually this plot suggest. But I mean, we, we ask ourselves, is really the mechanism like bulk water? And um, we can go a little bit more in the details and analyze what happens in the, in the simulation. And in particular, I mean, in the simulation, of course, we can look at uh, different type of waters. So, so this, this highlighted in colors, it's uh, what I call a pin water. So very close to a defect here, uh, fluoride is missing. And so there's a, a, a positive uh, defect. And it's a very, uh, very stable water, which with the residence time, which exceed the, the simulation time. So these are also other waters that have in these layers that we have excited. So if, for example, now we look at the double double correlation between this pinned water and the water in its first solvation shell, we see that these hydrogen bonds are not only quite strong, but also very stable. 
And uh, this is, for example, uh, uh, a typical correlation function between a dipole dipole correlation function between a pin water and uh, its first uh, layer. While this is a correlation function for water, let's say more or less in the bulk. I wouldn't say it's, we are already in the bulk here, but okay, getting closer to the bulk. So you can see that uh, the, the correlation times are, are very much different. And, um, and these, uh, uh, of course, uh, um, it's pointing to a special role of, of these hydrogen bonds. And so this is again the first layer, and this is what more or less we can call bulk. So what happens? So this water here in this layer uh, has a quite different numbers of uh, hydrogen bonds and so of uh, waters in its first solvation shell. So in particular, uh, this first layer is as a coordination number of 2.45 with uh, uh, slightly more than 60% of uh, uh, donors, a bit less acceptor. While these are the reference uh, for, for the bulk water, just standard uh, treated at the same level in terms of uh, uh, ab initio dynamics. So actually this water here, which we excite, are, have more or less half of the solvation shell. But interesting, in this first layer, a very fast transfer can occur. So as faster in the water, but just with half of the solvation shell. So overall, we can say that it seems to believe to behave like bulk water, but it's actually very different from bulk water. So, so what we have seen is that uh, a localized charge can actually uh, strongly affect the, the water behavior, and in particular it's capable of uh, transferring energy as efficient as a full solvation shell in the bulk. So I think this, this is a quite interesting uh, example of type of information that one can, can get from, from the simulation no? and one wouldn't have uh, so maybe easily guessed before. Um, on the other end, I mean, if uh, instead of uh, um, having this charge defect, the surface is different. So, for example, now uh, going to IPH, uh, um, basically the OH group starts to appear, but they are actually rather hydrophobic. And uh, so they do not form really hydrogen bonds. So now, if we now go and look at this type, this other type of, of surface, uh, which is uh, more or less an hydrophobic surface, we can see that the, the relaxation time is, is actually changed pretty much. This is the experimental value, which exceeds the two um, uh, picoseconds. And this is our uh, simulation times. Okay, pretty noisy, but I mean, we, we can say that uh, actually we also find very slow relaxation time. And this is essentially due to the complete absence of uh, of hydrogen bond on, on such surface and of course to uh, a much, uh, um, a much uh, um, different, uh, different arrangement of the first water layer. So I think it's uh, possibly time to wrap up. So I've shown you how combined um, phase sensitive SFG experiments and abolition molecular dynamics can permit to elucidate details of water interfaces. We have seen a couple of examples. And um, in particular, uh, calculated spectra, even with uh, you know, this fast uh, uh, VDOS uh, approach, uh, can provide a molecular assignment of uh, the different features which are observed in the experiments. And point, for example, to, to some interesting effects like uh, uh, the difference, the strong difference between localized and delocalized charges. Um, Non-equilibrium simulation in vibrational excited states uh, permits to identify pathways for the energy flow and permit also to um, provide a molecular interpretation of the two-dimensional, so pump probe um, SFG experiments. And uh, so, for example, we have figured out that it, it's possible to have uh, a funds transfer at the charged interface with just half of the solvation shell. So with this, I think I can conclude. Thank you very much for your attention. If there's any question, I would be happy to answer. 
Um, thanks a lot, uh, Maria Lore, for the very illustrative talk about uh, uh, computational spectroscopy, also the relation between experiment and theory. Uh, and I think that in general, uh, relation with spectroscopy, I mean, spectroscopy is becoming uh, a tool which is more and more important uh, uh, for uh, understanding uh, uh, surface chemistry, but uh, also surface electrochemistry. I think that there is a lot uh, to develop uh, in this field. Um, is there any question? I do see one. Uh, oh, in the chat. <laughs> you don't see. So there's one in the chat from. Ah, yes, okay. Uh, yes. Do you yes, want yes. to ask your question? Your question, or should I read it? Yes, Rashid, would you like to uh, read your question? Uh, yeah, I. To, to, uh, to I tell your to ask your question. Sorry. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So I, I was just wondering. Um, when you when you talked about um, testing the um, defects, the surface defect and the hydrogen proton, I was just wondering at the um, um, the role of hydrogen protons um, in in actually the um, experimental data. So, um, do you think that although it's not as prominent as the surface defects, but maybe uh, it, it its existence is actually very necessary and has like some sort of a butterfly effect where, you know, um, it, it actually starts um, all the observed phenomena that you observe in the experiment, just like at a very tiny scale. So what I, what I want to say is that if you remove it, you might not even observe what you observe in the experiment. I was just thinking through these lines, so. Uh, well, uh, these are, uh, you know, experiments which are done at low pH. Uh, and of course, the, there's gonna be uh, for sure. Uh, protons at the, at the interface. So the point that I wanted to more to, and the, you know, always comparing absolute values uh, from, from the simulation and to the experiment, this is always uh, kind of uh, tricky. Uh, what I think it's interesting uh, to, to really see from the simulation is that uh, uh, if uh, for the very same system, we look at the effect of a charge and we can put in the same charge, no? because putting in a couple of protons is essentially the same as putting in uh, two charge defects uh, so that the, the, the charge is, is this, the two plus in the, in the two cases. Um, I think it's, it's, really, it's really interesting because it shows us how the, the SFG spectra uh, can be extremely different. And then, you know, in, in the simulation, these two systems have the same size, the same composition, with the same very, very simplified model. And I think it's, uh, it's interesting to see how uh, a localized defect can orient the water and then, of course, produce a much stronger response. And then, you know, an imaginary part of the response function, which is much, much larger than in the, in the proton. So the, the way I see is that both are there. I mean, to, to have a, such a strong single signal, for sure there would be protons around, but there must be a defect as well, because the defect is it's really then producing a very, very intense signal. Thank you. Um, is there any other question? If not, actually, I wanted to ask you, uh, I mean, a $1 million question. I mean, what's the role of uh, quantum effect in understanding uh, uh, like uh, vibrational relaxation, for instance? Mm -hmm. um, this, this is actually uh, an, an interesting point. So um, I don't think there is really um, a very, very strong uh, role. Uh, and I, I think that it's it's really difficult to um, to appreciate this. But on the other end, there is an interesting aspect. And in, in the experiments, uh, the iterated water is used a lot, and the reason is that it's used to to actually break the symmetry in the water and the coupling, for example, between modes. So uh, imagine that you start with the water and you add some deuterated one that will be exchanged. So at some point, you will end up with uh, HOD, which has completely different properties, uh, vibrational property with respect to, to the H2O or the D2O, in the sense that uh, the modes are different and the coupling, for example, um, between the, the stretching and the bending 
can be can be broken. So, for example, in a, in the case of H two O, we know that the there is some coupling between the the, the stretching and then the bending over tone because they they happens really to be at the the, the same frequency. Uh, but if you, of course, if you do a deuterated uh, solution when you you start to introduce. Um, um, D2O, then you, you break this, and then, of course, you change your modes. And then this, uh, this is a, um, a routine technique from the experimentalists just really to, to try to understand the effects. It's been, for example, used in the case of the, of the water uh, surface, because there uh, the, the behavior of an H2 water molecules, which an H sticking out, or H, H, uh, OD with either H or this thing out, it's, it's very different. So actually these effects are very much used from the experimentalists and of course are of also interest to, to simulate. Um, I mean, I cannot exclude, but I, I suppose it's kind of second order and a kind of a very expensive second order from the simulation. So, so I mean, uh, um, so, so far, uh, I haven't been uh, I haven't been addressing, but but I I, I think it's uh, I, I think it's getting more and more affordable. I mean, we have seen that um, in the, in the presentation of Marcella. So I think it's 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 getting on the on a reasonable um, time scale. Um, thank you. Um, is there any other question? Okay, so if not, in the interest of uh, time, I would uh, thanks again, uh, uh, Maria Lore, and uh, pass to the next speaker, uh, who 